announcement that we get to make today. I want to begin by acknowledging members of our team, in particular our Chief Legal Counsel Paige Scott Reed, Deputies Adam Hornstein and Dara Kesselheim. Also, uh, and standing with me, Secretary Terrence Reedy, uh, assisted by Deputy Secretary Sue Terry of the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, uh, Chair Tina Hurley and members of the State Parole Board who serve as the Advisory Board of Pardons and conduct the initial petition reviews. We're also joined here today by a number of our uh, elected officials, and we welcome members of the general court who are with us today and thank them for the work that they do. Um, we also are joined today by leaders in the civil rights and legal community. We have members of the Urban League, the ACLU, Mass Bar Association, Greater Boston Legal Services, uh, private law firms, and representatives from Prisoners Legal Services, as well as the Women in Incarceration Project at the Center for Women's Health and Human Rights, among others. And there are other uh, guests who have joined us here today. Um, and importantly, we have uh, members who uh, we you will learn more about as we go forward. Uh, but Glenn and Lisa King are, are here to, to my uh, immediate left. Um, one of the most significant powers that a governor gets to exercise is to grant clemency for past violations of the law with the advice and consent of the governor's council. It's an important responsibility. It's one I take very seriously. As former attorney general and chief of the Civil Rights Division, I believe deeply in our justice system and the work, the important work of making it more fair and equitable for all of our residents. As governor, I also believe in honoring the courage and compassion of our state and its people. In recent decades, governors have not issued clemency recommendations in their first term, let alone in their first six months. But I believe, and the lieutenant governor believes, that justice delayed can be justice denied. I believe our approach to clemency should reflect our state's commitment to justice that is timely, fair, equitable, and compassionate. So today, I am recommending seven individuals to the Governor's Council for pardons of past convictions. These are folks who were convicted of crimes many years ago at a young age. They accepted responsibility for their mistakes and paid their debts to society. They've spent decades abiding by our laws, supporting their families, volunteering in their communities, and in many cases, living exemplary lives of service to others. They want to continue this service, but they face barriers and uncertainties because of their long ago convictions. They are people who have redeemed themselves many times over and now seek closure to be able to move on in their journeys. Glendon King is with us, and you'll hear from him today. He's a father of six, a grandfather of 10, a great-grandfather to one. Glenn is a US Army and Army National Guard veteran who was honorably discharged in 2021, excuse me, in 2001, before going on to serve for 20 years protecting his community with the Boston Fire Department. His convictions happened three decades ago. This is a man devoted to family who has given back to his country and his community year after year, and his community supports his pardon. Each of these petitioners has a similar story of embracing second chances and redeeming past mistakes. John Ladder is a career nurse who wants to volunteer his skills in retirement, but a conviction from 57 years ago stands in his way. Xavier Del Valle, since being convicted at age 19, has earned his GED and given back to his community by volunteering. He's an airline worker now who wants to become a mechanic and join the military. Adam Ahmet is in the midst of medical treatment for prostate cancer and is seeking pardon for a drug convention, conviction 28 years ago. Gerald Wolowanda is a father of two, active in his church and community, convicted of a drug possession when he was 18. Debbie Pickard is a licensed social worker, sober for 29 years, who helps others suffering like she did from childhood trauma and substance use disorder. As individuals, these men and women have been carrying the burden of their convictions and dealing with consequences 
far beyond their legal sentences. They deserve compassion, and pardoning them is the right thing to do. At the same time, their cases reflect the potential that clemency holds to strengthen our justice system. So to that end, in the coming months, our administration is going to have the opportunity to revise our state's clemency guidelines. Our legal office is working with stakeholders across the community and our partners in government to build consensus around the purpose and potential impact of pardons and commutations. What we know is that clemency is a fundamental and important right of our justice system. It provides an opportunity to soften the harshest edges of this system. And today, we have a much better understanding of where those harsh edges are and what we need to do to address them. So we are looking at ways of ensuring greater fairness and timeliness in reviewing petitions. We're looking at clemency as a potential tool for mitigating racial disparities and other inequities. We're looking at modernizing clemency to account for the science of brain development and how people's judgment can improve through early adulthood. Young people change and grow. Another person you'll hear from is Terrence William. He and his wife will join us in just a moment. Terrence has been working as a public servant for the city of Boston in Boston Water and Sewer for over three decades. He has long been active in his community, even starting an organization to take kids on trips outside of the city to play basketball. But 39 years ago, in 1984, he was in school horsing around with a friend. He got arrested for fighting, ended up being judged delinquent by the juvenile court. His friend didn't press charges. His friend remains his friend to this day and supports his pardon along with members of their community. Terrence's experience, like those of fellow petitioners, teaches us something about justice. Justice consists not only in punishment and not only in forgiveness either. Justice requires understanding. And justice requires the courage to take action and to do better, not only as individuals but as a system. That's why we're committed to advancing justice together as a state and as a commonwealth that believes in truth and progress. We look forward to working with our governor's council as they advise and consider these recommendations. I want to thank all of our recommended petitioners for their patience and perseverance, as well as their families. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Glenn King to share more about what this moment means for him. Glenn. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I want to thank the governor and her staff and everybody else involved with this so much. It's, I'm happy, very, very happy. Thank you so much. Uh, to make a long story short, I'm going to make it as quick as I can. I, I was born in Jamaica, I grew up in Boston, went to elementary school in Boston, went to Latin Academy in Boston, and eventually went on to University of Pittsburgh and joined the Army after that. Life was going great for me. But for whatever reason, when I came home in the early, late 80s, peer pressure was everywhere. It was rampant. It was nothing you could do about it but join whatever there was to, to make life happen. So that's what I did. Unfortunately, that was a wrong decision. I'm, I regret that up until this day. And I don't know, all I can say is those that, um, America's a land of opportunity. The opportunity is there. You just got to make it happen. Okay, there's the right way and the wrong way. I eventually took the wrong way for a short moment of time, but I got right back on track. The fire department was nice enough to accept me. I appreciate that too. And I've been living large ever since. Thank God. That's it. Uh, and we're it, it's great to be able to welcome Glenn to the State House. We are welcoming him back to the State House because during his time as a firefighter for what, 18 years? At this firehouse, yes. On Cambridge Street, 
he actually responded to many calls here in this building. And so I just want to note that and say it's particularly uh, special to invite you back in this capacity. We thank you for your service and we look forward to all uh, that is to come for you and your family. Thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, at this time, I'm happy to take questions. I don't know if Terrence, who's also working, he's going to be He's just a few minutes? Okay, so we'll go out of, out of order, but I ask uh, you to, uh, to stop with questions when, when Terrence arrives here, okay? All right, he's coming from work. So, so why do you think you're different from the history of uh, so many cards so early in your administration? Um, to, me, it, to me, it's just the right thing to do, and I want to thank the legal team. We talked about uh, this a lot. I, I have long been a proponent of criminal justice reform and, you know, have been interested in making sure that our system is fair and equitable. We know through time, through so much study, uh, of the systemic inequities and disparities that exist. We also, though, have the opportunity to do something about those disparities. And we have to operate across a number of realms and, you know, make sure that we have the resources there for programming, for training, so that young people today have the opportunities and the positive opportunities. That's very, very important, those investments. And we also need to take a hard look at what's happened within a system and ways in which we can change that. And this is a way that we can change that. And you know, I come to this as uh, an attorney general and somebody who formerly held the Civil Rights Division, uh, working alongside any number of advocates, and I, and I appreciate the role of advocates here and lawyers and others who've pushed, including pushing uh, on government for criminal justice reform. There's obviously a lot more work to do, but you know our attitude is in this job, in this administration, the charge to everybody is make the most of each moment, every day every day across all agencies, across all realms. And if there's something there to operationalize and implement, then let's go and let's get after it. And as I say, this is part of it, and we look forward to um, uh, working with the Governor's Council and, and hopeful that they'll be acting on, on these recommendations. Governor, this is an unusually less than six months into your first term. What would you say to folks who say maybe have more pressing matters to focus on in your first six months? There are no doubt any number of pressing matters. You cover them regularly and, importantly, report on them regularly. But I think we're a team and an administration that's able to, to operate on multiple fronts. Uh, this, to me, is a no-brainer. Um, so, you know, people may credit us for, for early action on this. To me, uh, it just goes back to justice delayed is justice denied. And it, it was simple to, to act on this with the quality of the petitions, the work of the legal team and the governor's legal counsel's office. Um, and it was right to take this action today. Uh, they have these these are recommendations that that existed um, but you know as governor I now have an opportunity to act on them and we were both uh, uh, pleased uh, to act on them and we look forward to, to further work in in this area I don't know Glenn if you wish to say anything or not but. Um, not really I mean this this started from the yeah. this started from uh, Governor Baker's administration um, it was been a long process um, when he departed um, Governor Healy took over now her administration so I guess at that point, she makes the decision. And fortunate enough for me, she made the right decision. What is going to be the right decision? What will it make for you going forward here? Well, for a gentleman that's got a good head on his shoulder to be labeled as a convicted felon for years, it's not a good thing, OK? I've done everything by the book, everything right. I just wanted to get rid of that label. So there's not a practical reason. It's more your heart. It's, it's heart, plus uh, my Second Amendment rights have been gone for years. I'd like to see that come back. Great. Thank Welcome. you. Welcome. OK. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Glenn, to you and Lisa King for being here. And now, uh, Terrence, we, we talked a little bit about Welcome. you earlier, but uh, we very much appreciate you and your wife being here. If, if you wish to say anything can step right up. Thank y'all. Um, first, I want to thank God for this for this day. You know, finally here. Um, thank you to my wife who stood by me. Uh, 
Thank you to my bishop who always prayed for me. And thank you to my state reps, my senators who always stood by my back. But I most must thank you, Governor, you know, just, you just for doing this. You know, I mean, I told the governor before, she probably don't know that, um, you know, she, that she was going to be governor way before. You know, and she laughed at me. But look at where she's at now. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. But look where she's at now. Um, you know, this has been, uh, you know, a long journey. This has been something, um, just a horse around. You know, you know, my charge was me and a friend of mine who was like my brother was horsing around in school. Um, and we was just playing around, you know, he hit me with something and my reaction just hit him with something. Um, and that's where this journey began. Um, just to horse around in school, you know, it wasn't nothing malice, wasn't nothing, you know, intention, you know, it was just playing around in school. But here I am, you know, 39 years later, you know, getting a pardon, you know, I mean, you know, everybody's here, you know, and I think, you know, we really need to look at, you know, people who are out there just like me, you know, who just made a mistake, you know, years ago, who just wants that opportunity, you know, just to come back to society. I never gave up. I tell my kids, I tell everybody, never, never give up. Only time you give up is when God called you home and then you gave up. Um, my daughter never gave up. She, she played for Phoenix Mercury. You know, her name is Shaylani Petty. If you look her up, you see her journey. She never gave up. That's why I still in all my kids, all the young ones who um, I mentor, to never give up. Continue to fight for whatever you believe in. You know, never give up. Because there's somebody out there who's going to hear your story, who's going to listen to your story, and who's going to believe your story. And then they're going to give you that opportunity, you know, to keep pushing. I want to say thank y'all. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. You know, and thank you to my state, Rep. Russell Holmes. Thank you for always being there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry, just he has a question. Well, you know, there is a normal process. We follow the advisory board of, of, of pardons. Uh, these were recommendations that had come to the governor's desk um, earlier. And once we had the opportunity to look at them, we made the decision to take action and recommend these pardons uh, to the governor's council. Were each of these sent to Governor Baker? They were. They were previously provided to the prior administration. whenever justice requires it. And in terms of going forward, next steps, as I mentioned, we're going to be undertaking a process of reviewing existing clemency guidelines, uh, and that will be through communication and collaboration where we're seeking input from a variety of stakeholders. So that will be the next order of business. And in the meantime, should we receive further pardon uh, requests, we'll, we'll take them in due course. But, you know, this isn't, a, this isn't about numbers, it's about people, and it's about circumstance, and it's about ensuring that we have a justice system that is true to the rule of law, that addresses and recognizes head-on some of the systemic disparities and failings within the system, and that is working to make a stronger, fairer, uh, more equitable, equitable criminal justice system. That will benefit not only communities long disadvantaged by the current system, it will also make our communities and our commonwealth safer. Is there usually a political downside? Is that what keeps you from happening and somehow either you don't have it because of what your administration is in with or you decide I don't care? I don't care. I don't know. I have a job to do. I have a job to do and as I said at the outset, you know, there are any number of responsibilities that a governor and a lieutenant governor have an opportunity to, to exercise clemency and consideration of pardons, commutations, and clemency requests is uh, certainly a significant responsibility and one we, we willingly accept. Governor, the clemency guidelines were, were tightened under your predecessor, Governor. What specifically do you think you have to change about it? Did you, did you, did you, did you, did you, 
I can't say yet, honestly. I mean, that's part of what, what the process is now going forward in terms of having um, a thoughtful, considered look at the current guidelines and figuring out what, if anything, we, we want to modify or change. But we felt very comfortable moving forward with these recommendations uh, based on the current guidelines. I have a question. Yeah. Can you talk about the changes that you'll make in your life and, and if you were receiving these earlier, what kind of a change would that <laughs> yes, I am too old for the academy, but you know I'm not too old. You know to still uh, help our community out. Um, it's going to make a big change. Um, years ago, me and um, a friend of mine, we were supposed to have start a business together, a security the business, um, and because of this, it denied me from starting it with him. But he proceeded on with it, um, so I'll be joining him um, on his security business and um, helping them out um, as we planned. Um, in the past. Governor, Thank you. You, you, Thanks, Terrence. Last Thank question. You. you freed yourself and said that you wanted to move to um, target those with simple marijuana possession conviction, similar to what they do at the federal level, sort of a wholesale mm -hmm. target. Is, do you plan to make that part of the guidelines, or uh, how do you foresee that? Uh, you know that and you know that part, you know, those type of parts. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think certainly in the past I've spoken out about this before. I'm. I, think we need to do so in a way that legally you know makes sense um, and so more work to do on that but that's certainly you know something that I'm mindful of we don't want to be anybody to be set back held back from housing from employment from school uh, because of a simple marijuana possession violation which you know obviously marijuana is legal here in the state right now and so um, more work and more to come on that but again I want to thank everybody for uh, for being here. I want to thank in particular the Governor's Office legal team for their work on this, uh, for the various uh, stakeholders represented in this room who have long done advocacy in this space, uh, to members of the general court who continue to, to enact uh, and think about ways we need to make our system of criminal justice fair and more equitable, and uh, I think most importantly to the individuals and their families who are receiving the recommendation of pardon today. Uh, they represent, in my view, uh, resilience, strength, perseverance, possibility, opportunity. And that is the role of government, to make sure that we're finding ways each day to create more opportunity for folks and to move forward in a way that is constructive, that is productive. Uh, we've got a lot of challenges in government. We're taking them all head on, um, one by one. But in this realm, we're, uh, we're delighted to be here today. And while Terrence, you know, may not join the academy, uh, he may be able to, to uh, to, to, to do his security business. I know he will continue, for example, to mentor kids. I know he can still play basketball, which I think is how we met. And, uh, and we look forward to success for all of these individuals and, and await uh, what hopefully will be positive action by our governor's council. Thank you all for coming.